thank you very much. Uh, my name is Matt Brakey. This is actually the second time I've had the honor of uh, standing at this podium. I addressed this group uh, last year for my county council bid. And uh, this time around I get to present to you Ron Paul and uh, give you some background about him and why you should potentially consider him as a selection for the 2012 nominee for the Republican Party for president. Uh, next slide. Uh, Ron Paul, he was an Air Force flight surgeon. Um, he's an OBGYN. He, he's helped deliver over 4,000 babies. Uh, 12 term <coughs> Texas congressman. And he's also chairman of the House Monetary Policy Subcommittee. And if any of you have been following what's going on with the Federal Reserve and Ron Paul's uh, position on the Federal Reserve, you would, you would uh, quickly realize. <laughs> Uh, he's 75, a Baptist, a graduate from Gettysburg College and Duke Medical School. He's been married for 54 years, has five children, and his most prominent son would be uh, the junior senator from Kentucky, Rand Paul, who I know is uh, quickly becoming a Tea Party favorite. Uh, as far as Ron Paul's character, uh, this first bullet really struck me. When he was a doctor, he refused to take any Medicare or Medicaid payments from his patients. Instead, he would either work for free or arrange a discount. And what really struck me about that is he was doing that when no one was watching. This was before he was in politics. It was just, he was that principle that he was willing to put his own financial welfare second. Uh, next, uh, he opted out congressional health and uh, health care and pension plans. He's chosen not to accept those. And also, he returns a portion of his budget each and every year. <coughs> now, th this is where it gets describing Ron Paul. You say he's a libertarian, you say he's a conservative. I, I, I have the term constitutional conservative out there. And um, in a way, I almost don't like labels because. Once you use them, everyone has like a preconception of what that means. I almost kind of like to peel back the onion and consider the issues. Uh, I call him a constitutional conservative here. Probably another good description is non-interventionist. Uh, when it comes to the economy, he thinks the government should not be intervening in private contracts and property rights and the like. Uh, when it comes to foreign policy, he thinks we should not be interfering within the internal affairs of sovereign nations. And he doesn't think we should be policing the world and nation building. And when it comes to civil liberties, he's a big supporter of the Bill of Rights and does not think that the federal government should be passing any sort of legislation that is unconstitutional. Next slide. So, yes, Ron Paul holds many positions that are commonly considered to be libertarian, and he was, in fact, the Libertarian Party's presidential candidate in 1988. So does that make him a libertarian? Does that make him a conservative? Uh, I, I think that depends on how you define conservative. And, and I put up a quote from uh, Ron Paul here. I'm not going to read it to you. But you know, he, he essentially defines conservatism here as, as working within the confines of the Constitution and limiting government within that scope. Uh, other people would not define it that way. So I, I think whether you call him a libertarian or conservative will largely depend on your own personal definition. Okay, Ron Paul on the economy. Uh, he is a big proponent of Austrian free market economics, and I think more and more people are starting to hear about that and understand what it means. This is opposed to Keynesian economics, which has really dominated the US political economy since the Great Depression uh, under FDR. This notion that government spending is what gets us out of recessions, printing money, artificially low interest rates, government intervention, good for the economy. Whereas Austrian free market economics says the opposite. It says basically you need to make government smaller, you need to cut taxes, and you need to allow private investment to occur in order for the economy to be spurred. So he's been advocating for that position for all his, his uh, congressional life. Uh, audit the Federal Reserve. Uh, it is one of the, probably the most powerful organization in the United States, if not the world. 
and we don't know what it's doing, where, where it's giving money to. Uh, abolish the IRS. He wants to take us back to a pre-16th Amendment America, where there's no income tax. How can you not have an income tax? Well, America didn't have an income tax for 140 years. We seem to get by just fine. But he, he specifically says, listen, if you want to get rid of the IRS, you're going to have to cut the size of government, not just domestically, but internationally as well. And we're not, we're not cutting budgets. We're cutting departments. We're, we're asking. And that's Ron Paul's vision for America and Ron Paul's vision for uh, post-IRS America. Okay, Austrian business cycle theory. Now, this is something I'll, I'll give presentations on. I can easily talk about for an hour, so I'm going to try to do it in 30 seconds. But essentially, Austrian business cycle theory holds that what gives rise to the boom-bust cycles in the economy, the financial bubbles, housing bubble, internet bubbles, it's not, uh, it's not capitalism. It is the Federal Reserve printing fiat currency, meaning money that is only given value because the government says it has value. It's not backed by any hard asset. So you have the Federal Reserve printing this money, setting artificially low interest rates, giving money to their political buddies, the commercial mm -hmm. banks, and then this money, this new inflation, it flows into different areas of the economy. And then where it flows, that's what gives rise to a bubble. And that bubble is just spurred on by not actual demand for, for the goods or services, but just uh, printed money. And that eventually burst. And so uh, Ron Paul, to his credit, correctly identified the housing bubble years before it was on the political radar. Uh, you know, he's been talking about gold since, since the 70s when Nixon went off the gold standard. And uh, right now he argues that we're going to be facing a dollar crisis in the near future. And so time will tell if he's right about that one as well. Next slide. Okay, Ron Paul and foreign policy. And, and you know, when I was seeing that pre uh, previous presentation, I, I really got goosebumps thinking about this. You know, Ron Paul, he's a non-interventionist, and he holds this crazy belief that we should take our marching orders not from the United Nations, not from the Arab League, but from the U.S. Constitution when it comes to committing our sons and daughters overseas. And, you know, I have that picture of Libya there, and Obama did not even talk to Congress before deciding to intervene. Uh, Congress, uh, Congress is given the power to declare war and grant letters of marquee and reprisal in Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. And, and Ron Paul believes that any time we send our sons and daughters in harm's way, we need to follow that Constitution. Uh, he thinks we should end foreign aid. Uh, and lots of people say, well, you know, end foreign aid, we give money to Israel. Is he against Israel? Well, we give $3 billion to Israel, but then we give $12 billion to the enemies of Israel, and we're giving money to Pakistan, who was harboring Osama bin Laden. And giving money to Mubarak, who was the dictator of Egypt, who was just overthrown, you know, quickly it gets pretty crazy. So um, Ron Paul would argue, end all that aid altogether and, and uh, let countries sort it out for themselves. Free trade, uh, he's for free trade, not managed trade. He's opposed to NAFTA and the World Trade Organization. He thinks that if you're going to have real free trade, you don't need government sending rules around. Uh, he thinks we should bring the troops home. And that's not just Iraq and Afghanistan, that's the 130 countries that we, plus countries that we have U.S. troops stationed in, over 730 military bases around the world. And um, he calls that empire. And other, you know, people can call it what they will, but even if you disagree with him philosophically on that, I think a lot of people are starting to agree that we just can't afford it. So he's for a radical reshaping of our foreign policy. Uh, and, and in that, he, he always cites the Constitution, he always cites the advice of the founding fathers who, uh, who warned us against entangling alliances and slaying uh, monsters abroad. Next slide. Okay, when it comes to civil liberties, he's opposed to the Patriot Act, the Department of Homeland Security. You know, he would call that a federal police force, uh, you know, frisking uh, six-year-old girls at the airport. Um, the drug war. Now, this, this is where the record screeches for a lot of conservatives when you mention uh, the war on drugs. But keep in mind, he's opposed to the federal drug war. He thinks the police power is reserved for the states, and that's not to say Ohio would, would revoke its drug laws if they were to uh, repeal federal drug law. Guantanamo Bay, he's opposed to it. He thinks that, uh, that we have the ability to prosecute terrorists in U.S. courts of law, and we did that the last time around with the original World Trade Center bombings. Terrorists there were tried and convicted, 
and I recognize some conservatives disagree with that. Uh, same with torture, thinks the U.S. should not torture. Next. Okay, other positions, Ron Paul is staunchly pro-life, and he, he puts forth a, a position that I find curious that most conservatives don't afford. He says, you can pass legislation that just removes this issue from the courts altogether and, and take it away from the courts, and that would, that would bring it back to a pre-Roe v. Wade world where states individually could decide whether uh, the abortion should be legal or illegal. So that's what he advocates for, and being a doctor, having delivered all, all those babies up, I don't know if you can say there's another candidate in this race that's more staunchly pro-life than Ron Paul. Uh, he opposes cap and trade. I mean, that should probably be a no-brainer. But he, he thinks we should withdraw from the United Nations because it infringes on U.S. sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah. And nowhere in the United States Constitution is allowed for the delegation of Powers reserved to the states and the federal government to be delegated to an international body. And he's, he stands very firmly in that group. Uh, strong borders, and, and I find this to be a refreshing uh, position. You know, lots of people are, say they're for strong borders, but he knows what the underlying problem is. You have all these illegal immigrants that when they come here, they get on social welfare programs and get free health care. So essentially, what we're doing is paying illegal immigrants to come here. And you're never, Ron Paul would argue, you're never going to have a long-term solution to this problem until you address that fund fundamental issue. But in the meantime, he thinks we should be protecting our border with Mexico instead of uh, protecting North Korea's border with South Korea. All right, I Googled Ron Paul crazy. This is the uh, picture that came up. <laughs> so let, let's go through the criticisms. Uh, too old. The man is 75 years old. He would be the oldest. Uh, presidential, oldest president if elected, but I suspect when people walk away from this presentation, they're not going to say, well, I would have voted for Ron Paul, but he's just too old. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's the other issues that are probably going to make or break him as a candidate, and from all accounts, he's in good health. Okay, he's crazy. Uh, you hear that a lot, and I think a lot of that was tied to the fact four years ago he was talking about gold all the time, and everyone was like, Gold standard, gold. What's, this is a barbarous relic. But of course, then the economy fell apart, and the Federal Reserve became front and center, and people were starting to pay attention to four dollar plus gasoline. And all of a sudden, having some sort of, some sort of commodity money doesn't sound all that crazy anymore. But you still hear that a, a lot. You know, maybe it's crazy. I don't know. Uh, and then this notion he's not a real Republican, that he's not a conservative, he's a libertarian. That all, all gets back to how you define those terms and what they mean for you personally. Uh, not electable. This is one I would actually uh, strongly disagree with. Uh, the polling data suggests the exact opposite. Uh, in a hypothetical one-on-one -on -one matchup, Ron Paul polled better against Obama than any other possible presidential contender in a CNN poll. And there was a recent poll of uh, Republican primary candidates, and he placed third with 10% of the vote. And if you remove Sarah Palin, he placed second with 12% of the vote, second only to Mitt Romney. So uh, I think lots of what people are saying haven't, hasn't yet caught up to the actual facts. Uh, this is going to be a big <laughs> issue for him. There was a newsletter in the 80s that, uh, that his name was attributed to that had some comments that could be construed as being racist. Uh, he didn't write it himself, it was ghostwritten, but uh, in 2008 the media brought this out, and you know how much the media loves to call people racist. So uh, if, if he were to make a lot of headway in this campaign, I suspect that there would be a similar attack on him, and he'd, he'd have to fight against that. Uh, Foreign policy, you know, it's a potential con because it, it, his foreign policy is very different than the foreign policy that the Republican Party has advocated in recent history. It's very similar to what the Republican Party advocated in the days of uh, Robert Taft and Barry Goldwater, but it, it's different than George W. Bush uh, foreign policy. Uh, position on drug war, we already talked about that. And the earmarks, he is unafraid to earmark uh, bills and to bring money back to his district. He argues that essentially, uh, if my district's gonna be paying these taxes, I'm gonna do everything I can to get this money back. 